Today on X-Play, we get freaked out by the most controversial game of the year, Manhunt. Why is there singing in my RPG? And how can I make it stop? It's Final Fantasy X2. The madness of this place had somehow fueled my rage. It's game time. Drop and roll. It's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. That's a useful safety tip That's if you're watching nice. the show and on fire. Hello and welcome to X-Play. Today's show has everything you could possibly ask for. Controversy. Scantily clad women in Final Fantasy X-2. And we have fully clad ninjas. And the final chapter in the Soul Reaver saga. And we'll take a look at Splinter Cell and Red Faction on the N-Gage. Yes, the N-Gage, the only portable device capable of making Adam act like Faye Dunaway in Chinatown. It's a cell phone. It's a, it's a handheld gaming device. It's a cell phone. It's a handheld gaming device. It's a, oh, oh, it's a cell phone and a handheld gaming device. Anyway, we should move on to Manhunt now. Yes, we should. When we heard that Rockstar North, the people who were responsible for Grand Theft Auto 3 and Vice City, they were releasing a brand new game, we were thrilled. Now, for all the uproar and outrage over GTA, it's ultimately a very good game and an effective satire of American pop culture. Yeah, it was violent. It was also really funny and yeah. fun. And, and then on the other hand, we have Manhunt, which is deadly serious. In fact, it's the first video game to be banned in New Zealand, so of course there'll be no Manhunt for Middle Earth. That's me a pity. Yeah. Still, it comes with a great pedigree. It's from Rockstar, and it sure looks creepy. Yeah, and you know, it has the voice of Brian Cox, and he was the guy who first played Hannibal Lecter in Michael Mann's 1986 film, Manhunter. Way to go, IMDb girl. And there are a lot of people who are going to find it absolutely appalling. So, here's a review of Manhunt. James Earl Cash, found guilty and sentenced to death has been on death row for the past three years and was executed last night. James Earl Cash can't seem to catch a break. You see, he's a serial killer who's about to be executed for, well, for being a serial killer. The good news is his execution was faked, so he gets to live. The bad news is he's been kidnapped by a crazy snuff film director and forced to star in a series of videos where it's kill or be killed. You've had an unexpected reprieve. Do exactly as I say, and I promise this will be over before the night is out. So, what's a cold-blooded murderer to do? Simple. Grab the nearest implement of pain and get to work. Manhunt is Rockstar Games' most overt attempt to cash in on over-the-top sadism and violence. So overt, in fact, that we can't show you most of the footage, or, ironically, the censors would kill us. Manhunt is also the game that family values touting senators will point to as they introduce new anti-video game legislation. So, thanks a lot, Rockstar. First, the good. Even though it's clearly using a modified version of the GTA 3 engine, the visuals are excellent and suitably creepy. The sound and music are also very good, especially Brian Cox's vocal performance as maniacal video director Lionel Starkweather. These streets are being patrolled by gangs. This guy, just like you. And they're here to hunt you down and cut you up. The core gameplay is also fairly solid, but Manhunt is really just a run-of-the-mill stealth game. You sneak around, hide in shadows, and try to take out the demented gang members before they spot you. You can also lean around corners and knock on the wall, solid snake style, to lure unsuspecting goons to their doom. If you are spotted, it's much better to just run away, as Manhunt uses the same crappy combat model found in Grand Theft Auto 3. Skinning you is gonna be a pleasure. The problem is that the game never goes far beyond what you experience in the first couple of levels. Sure, later you get access to firearms, but running around shooting isn't terribly fun thanks to the clumsy control scheme. So all that's left is the gratuitous violence. Now let me be perfectly clear, Manhunt is violent. If little Timmy wants this game for his birthday, just say no. Manhunt revels in sadistic carnage. By sneaking up behind a foe, you can dispatch them in several gruesome ways, depending on what weapon you're holding and how long you wait before delivering the killing blow. The longer you wait, the more graphic the kill. For the first 15 minutes or so, you will be shocked at the level of violence in this game. I wanna see blood, Cash. Blood! After that, 
and just runs out of steam. See, apparently no one told Rockstar that in order for extreme violence to be continually effective as a dramatic tool, there needs to be contrast. Manhunt has none. It's a one-trick pony in a very small corral. And that's why X-Play gives Manhunt for the PS2 a 2 out of 5. Yeah. Okay, I cannot say this emphatically enough. This is not a game for children. We're open-minded here, and it really isn't. It is so violent, so vicious, that when we aired what you saw there in the review, that was the clean part, okay? Now look, okay, so even in the game community, some people find the content of this game morally objectionable. And depending on sales, and depending on whether the media picks up on it, Manhunt will probably be a title that polarizes a lot of people. Okay, the one thing that isn't debatable is its quality. Yeah. All content issues aside, it's not a very good game, sure, but Manhunt is pushing the envelope, and Rockstar still has every right to do that. Now, whether people buy it or not, that's another story. We'll see. Okay, enough Manhunt. <sighs> yes, let's move on to something light and whimsical with ninjas. What's whimsical about a ninja? Well, this particular ninja has a grotesquely swollen head, oh, that's whimsy. but he still looks kind of cute. It works for him. Here's our review of I Ninja. Listen, Grasshopper, and learn the way of the ninja. The ninja uses stealth, he uses his skills with the sword to overwhelm his foes. He bowls over his foes with giant eyeballs. Yeah, okay. I Ninja is not your typical ninja game. Instead, it is one of the most variety-packed games we've seen in a long time. There's the typical jumping and sword fighting you'd expect from a platformer, but there's also rail grinding, barrel rolling, artillery shooting. Welcome to the Kiss Me Deadly Assault Cannon. And Rock'em Sock'em Robot style action, just to name a few. You play the aptly named Ninja, whose task is to free the world from the insidious rule of the evil Odor. To do this, Ninja must collect Rage Stones, which seem to be some kind of mystical crack. We're not quite sure why you would want to collect things that make you freak out and kill your sensei, but there you are. Actually, after hearing Sensei fumble his way through cliches, maybe a little decapitation isn't such a bad idea. Go now, and remember, a stitch in time is worth two in the bush. So what could be wrong with a game with this much humor and variety? Well, how about this? What if you had to play every single level again? And what if you were given new, tedious objectives like kill every enemy in the level or a time limit? Because rolling a giant eyeball over a narrow beam wasn't hard enough the first time. Now I have to do it really fast? I don't need that kind of pressure! And some of the levels aren't even all that much fun the first time around. Sure, battling a giant robotic fish sounds fun on paper, but as it turns out, it's actually kind of boring. A Ninja is not a terrible game. It could have been a great game if only the developers had known when to stop. It still gets kudos for cuteness and overall, dare I say it again, variety. But why, oh why, do we have to do everything twice? Knocking your enemies down like nine pins while riding a giant eyeball is great fun the first time, but after that, it just gets dull. Right. We give I Ninja a three out of five. There is some supernatural force keeping this door shut. I can't help you get through here, Ninja. Okay, so we didn't have time to talk about it in the review, but the cutscenes in I Ninja were done by Don Bluth. Go Don. Okay, Don Bluth is the man behind the arcade classics Dragon Lair, Dragon's Lair, and Space Ace. So it's nice to know he's back as long as he promises never to make anything like Dragon's Lair 3D again. <laughs> Hot vampire on zombie action in Legacy of Kate Defiance. It remembers that. Fighting the power-gloved hand that feeds them, it's Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb. Welcome back to X-Play. Fans of the Legacy of Kane series have been waiting a long time for closure. 
The epic vampire and demon saga has spanned several Blood Omen and Soul Reaver games, and every single one of them ends with a cliffhanger. Two tens. Okay, now, for the first time, the main characters of both titles, the vampire Kane and the demon Raziel, are both playable in one game. Yay! So, does it actually resolve those dangling plot lines? Well, find out in our review of Legacy of Kane Defiance. Given the choice, whether to rule a corrupt and failing empire, or to challenge the fates for another throw, a better throw against one's destiny, what was a king to do? After four games of blood sucking, soul reaving, and cliffhanger endings, Cain and Raziel return to take care of unfinished business in Legacy of Cain Defiance. No more questions, no more worship, time to run. Time to scream. Time to die. This time he plays both Kane and Raziel, alternating between levels. The fight picks up immediately after the end of Soul Reaver 2, which was actually centuries before the beginning of Soul Reaver 1, and about the same time as Blood Omen. Sort of. It's complicated. Just smile, nod, and go with it. The last two games had fairly weak combat. Oh. It remembers that, does it? But Defiance goes to moderate lengths to remedy this. In what can best be described as a Devil May Cry like fighting style, Kane and Raziel hack their foes up with special speed combos and air juggle attacks. After you stun them, you can suck their blood or steal their soul to boost your health. Booyah! With authority! It's fun the first few times, but. You'll be doing this a lot. Kane and Raziel's attacks are all pretty much the same, and there's a real lack of variety when it comes to the enemies. There are zombies, and angry human vampire hunters, and the occasional shadow monster thing. And that's about it. After a while, mopping the floor with nondescript monsters gets to be a bit of a chore. The chore is worth taking on, though, due to the absorbing and well-written story. Raziel is not what you think. You dare imagine what I think. <laughs> It might not make a lot of sense if you haven't played the previous games in the series, but the excellent voice acting and twisting plotline make Defiance hard to put down, even if you don't know who Mortanius and Janos Audrin are. First, your omniscience, and now your powers. You're slipping badly. Be ready for a lot of Kane's musings. These statues were singularly inanimate. I knew better than to assume they would always remain so. And lots of Raziel being introspective. The madness of this place had somehow fueled my rage. And as it subsided, I felt no elation. And hey, check out the big baddie, the Elder God. That eye looks strangely familiar. I can see into your heart, Raziel. Hmm. When not hacking up monsters and defying fate itself, you'll spend much of your time solving puzzles in the Vampire Forges. While the puzzles are pretty good, the forges themselves are almost all identical. It's way too easy to get mixed up and lost in these damp, curved hallways. Hey, Victus! Even with its minor problems, Defiance is the best Kane game since the first Soul Reaver, and provides a much-needed closure for the storyline. That's right, Kane fans, no cliffhangers here. Just intrigue, a few long-awaited answers, and a four out of five. One can only match, move by move, the machinations of fate, and thus defy the tyrannous stars. Ooh. This is the masterpiece theater of vampire demon games. It's not really saying much. But we still like it. Okay, for full reviews of other Blood Omen Soul Reaver games, <laughs> or just to let us know what you think about Manhunt, you can do all of that by, by visiting our website. TechTV.com slash xplay. Thank you, thank you. We'll be back. Red Faction and Splinter Cell get also teeny tiny on the Engage. <laughs> What's with all these homies dissing Adam Sessler and Morgan Webb? Yeah, what's with them? Well, who, who are homies? Why are you dissing us? Oh, nice. Stop. Welcome back to X Play. All right, we're going to move on to our first game reviews on the M Gauge. All right, so in case you've missed the massive advertising campaign because you were in a coma, the N Gauge is a portable gaming system and it's also a cell phone. Oh, hello? Yes? Orlando Bloom? 
I would love to go out with you. And apparently it makes a phone call for you as well. Okay, the handheld market has, of course, been dominated by the Game Boy Advance, as you yes. can see right here. But we thought we'd see how our favorite titles here at X-Play, Splinter Cell, which we loved on the Xbox, the PS2, the GameCube, and the Game Boy Advance, holds up on another portable handheld. We're also going to take a look at Red Faction. Why? Because it was ported to the end gauge by John Romero, as in the John Romero who developed Doom. And Daikatana. Hmm, yeah. Here are reviews of Splinter Cell and Red Faction for the Engage. Splinter Cell was a big hit on the consoles, and now it's been adapted for Nokia's Engage in a surprisingly faithful but brief interpretation. Just like the console versions, you play as Sam Fisher. The game story is also the same, though it's told via scrolling text. The object is to find ways through each level without being detected. You can hide in the broom closet or sneak up from behind and deliver an incapacitating blow. Sam can also use his gun to subdue enemies, and there are plenty of locks to pick. The vertical screen can make it hard to see what's coming up, especially when Sam's running, but the sticky camera can help you scope things out. It's fun, but it's also quite short for a shadowy three out of five. The Engage port of Red Faction is far less successful. It's an ugly, muddy mess, even by handheld standards. Even with such low-grade visuals, it still can even avoid slowing down and stuttering. Hey, Tomb Raider proved that 3D was possible on this system, so what gives? It's mostly a series of brown and gray hallways that all look the same. Prepare to get lost repeatedly. That is, when you're not being assaulted by the same enemies over and over. Die, miner. Die, miner. Die, miner. Yeah, yeah, die, miner. I am thoroughly nonplussed by your witty repartee, sir. Factor in the clunky controls and not too bright auto lock feature, and you've got yourself a bonafide one out of five. Okay, obviously Splinter Cell translated a lot better than Red Faction did, but then again, Red Faction isn't really something that should be on a portable in the first place. You know, it's kind of like 007 Nightfire for the GBA. You put a first-person shooter on a handheld, you go blind. Now, on the upside, you can link your N-Gage to someone else's N-Gage, and you can inflict Red Faction on them. Oh, goody. <sighs> Next, marketing geniuses put cute girls in Final Fantasy X2. Lonely men everywhere rejoice. Footage at 11. Once again, the Sherry Lewis and Lamb Chop of X-Play, Morgan Webb and Adam Sessler. Mm. Everything about that disturbs me. Lamb Chops. We are back with the moment many people have been waiting for, Final Fantasy X-2. It's a sequel to Final Fantasy X, mm -hmm. and it's the first game sequel to any Final Fantasy game. Now this time around, it's the ladies of Final Fantasy who take center stage, and apparently they've been watching too many episodes of Gem and the Holograms. Here's our review of Final Fantasy X-2. Ready, boys? Of course he's ready! When Final Fantasy X-2 was first unveiled, RPG nuts worldwide were certainly excited. But with newcomers to the most famous role-playing series ever, might get a rash from repeatedly scratching their heads in confusion. Who the heck is Len? Nonetheless, X-2 kicks the proverbial ass. You just need to get with the program. Veterans of the Final Fantasy series know that having heroes in life-threatening jeopardy is simply just par for the course. Poor girl. But what you might not know about is all the singing. And dancing. Yep, Britney Spears has nothing on this show. X2 has Yuna, the quiet, straight-laced heroine of the first game, letting her hair down with her friends Riku and the newcomer Pain as part of a sphere-hunting team known as the Gullwings. Say cheese! The girls can fly around the world of Spira in this aircraft, but it can be difficult to keep track of the main quest. Hi, is this a sub-quest? Hi, w do you know if this is the main quest or not? I'm trying to find the main quest. Uh-huh, that's right! The simple fact is, there's so much to do around Spira that a better name for the game might have been Side Quest, the video game. What? Asfinger says what? What what? Never mind. 
What follows is a good deal of combat, and the opposition can be really nasty. It's a good thing these girls brought along a change of whites. Every girl knows that having the right outfit and accessories is crucial for making the right impression. Um, no. No, no. Please. How about the sexy yet sinister witchy poo look? It's a little embarrassing. Each outfit allows for different strengths, and the right combos can lead to some classic victories. For example, one girl can mesmerize a fellow with her songs and foxy dancing. Want to sing along? But another girl can steal stuff from them while they're mesmerized. It's all in the wrist. And when they have nothing left to give, you can finish them off while they're sleeping. You had your chance to run. Like I said, classic. But it's not all action. In between missions, there's still plenty of time to run around the ship playing grab ass. La 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 monkey butt. Or simply throw a little party on deck. Yeah, so okay. The game might not be everyone's cup of tea, but it's fun, lengthy, and action-packed. We give Final Fantasy X to a pop rockin', chick lovin', way cutesy. You haven't changed a bit, Tubby. Four out of five. What? No thanks? I think some Final Fantasy fans will love it, and others will feel oddly emasculated by it. Yeah, I think I've gone blind. <laughs> okay, and before you send us an angry email, we know the Final Fantasy Emma Children is a sequel to Final Fantasy VII, but it's a movie, not a game. Yell at us at our website. Yes, techtv.com slash xplay. Send us happy or angry email there. Good night.